um, Rich, um, Rich Banta here is the co-owner of Lifeline Data Centers. He's our speaker for tonight. Rich, uh, if you didn't all read the uh, little brief bio in the Eventbrite thing, um, all I can say is I've known Rich almost as long as I've been in IT. He and Alex, his partner, and his lovely wife uh, over here on the right, sponsored the, uh, the dinner tonight. So let's give them a round of applause and thanks for that. He's going to speak to us about the fun-fill topic of FISMA and FedRAMP. Now, this has just come back from some training with the people who wrote the book on FISMA. Um, being a, a partner over at Lifeline Data Center, he's very familiar with the needs and the demands of clients who need FISMA compliance in the data center uh, environment. And uh, I will turn it over to Rich and we'll let him knock us dead. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Well, obviously this is really dry subject material. Can you hear me in the back? Am I mic'd appropriately? Okay. I will do my best not to cough. If I rip it off madly, it's because there's a big coughing seizure coming on. Um, I am with Lifeline Data Centers, and ordinarily we don't talk up our business as much when we do these deals, but since we bought the pizza, we thought it would give me a couple, two or three minutes. Uh, Lifeline is a high-tech landlord here in Indianapolis and expanding into Fort Wayne. We've been in business since February 2001. And presently, we are just a high-tech landlord. We sell space, power, cooling, physical security, and we are a compliance boutique. People come to us because they have uh, over half the business that comes through our doors comes because they've done a gap analysis approaching a certification and recognize the need. Worse yet, they failed an audit, and now they're desperate. Uh, but we get people through audits. We have a lot of qualifications in those areas, but we have 30,000 square feet in production in downtown Indianapolis on Henry Street, 90,000 square feet built out and about 60% in production on the east side at the former Eastgate Mall. We're building out 110,000 square feet in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And that is going to be a full-blown EMP protected facility. Um, and working with some members of Congress and following stuff through, I was out at Data Center World in, in Las Vegas where I was a speaker. but. Uh, the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act is headed for the Reconciliation Committee in Congress, and we think EMP is going to work its way into this stuff. Fascinating subject. If you want enigma, that stuff really has it. Um, my certifications on the auditing side of the house are I'm a CISA, a C-RISC, grandfathered and then took the test, and a certified FISMA compliance practitioner, which we're going to touch on a little bit later. On the data center side, uh, certified, oops, certified data center expert, there's 11 of us in the U.S. Certified data center design professional, that is an Uptime Institute uh, accreditation. Certified uh, TN942 internal auditor, there are three of us in the country. TN942 design professional, four of us in the country. Reliability centered maintenance compliance analyst, and that is uh, we are a reliability-centered maintenance shop. It's kind of COBIT at the component level in uh, generators, UPS systems, that kind of stuff. It's advanced failure probability analysis. Really fun stuff if you like big math. Um, FISMA is uh, what it stands, it's the Federal Information Security Act of 2002. It came about after 9-1-1 and systems getting hacked all over the place. This is the long form. I could not find an elegant short form to describe it. So this is the description. But it's to strengthen information security. And the agencies are held accountable by the GAO, Government Accounting Office, and the Office of Management and Budget. And this is law. And it's in every agency out there. I plucked this off of DHHS. But this is law. This is not a suggestion or a guideline. Every agency will ensure that all technology acquisitions and that means services they buy from somebody like Lifeline, outsource services, it all has to be FISMA compliant. This has not been enforced, but the enforcement is coming online more and more rapidly. And we're seeing more breaches, and we know now of a uh, FISMA moderate system that was breached here in the last few days. So they are enforcing this, and that is, uh, this is where we're seeing the gap analysis and people heading our direction for help with their availability and physical security. I'm a process guy, so I'm going to take a process approach to this. It was the best way I could think of to remove the enigma. 
Um, how many people in here actually have to deal with the feds, FISMA or FedRAMP? This, this uh, may be a little pedantic for that, I apologize. Um, this, this is my take on it. And all the government stuff says there are six steps, but going into it, you do have to perform an inventory of the systems. We categorize the sensitivity of the data. We select the right controls. We bake the controls in. We have it assessed. We get the system authorized with the federal agency. It's called an authority to operate. And then it has to be monitored via some kind of continuous monitoring plan or some form of re-auditing every year. So preliminarily, you inventory the systems. And this is not the detailed granular, here is every virtual machine instance I have, here is every license key associated with it. This is the macro level. This is where we define the system and set the boundaries of what constitutes the system. And in consultant speak, this is where we set scope. I don't know how many consultants are here, but if it's outside of scope, I'll do it for you, but it'll cost more. Um, but th this is where we actually carefully define the boundaries of the system. And then a system can be something like a GSS, General Support Services, which is not the system delivering the goods to the taxpaying public, but the underlying email systems, physical security, backup generators, and availability controls. The more granular stuff comes later. At the granular level, it does include a identification analysis of every interface between every system, inside, outside, and what kind of data they're passing. And when somebody comes in to do their external assessment on this, they're going to port scan this and then sniff them down, see what's going back and forth. And if you haven't documented it, now you have a finding you're going to have to remediate. So that this is really critical. And it's a valuable thing to have. We, we're undergoing it ourselves right now. And uh, it was full of surprises. And just because you stuck that hole in the firewall doesn't mean there's other stuff going on out there. And there are lots of National In Institute for Standards and Technology special publications. And this is a very good one. It helps you inventory it, set your boundaries, define your systems so they don't overlap or you don't make them too narrow, too broad. There's an awful lot of wiggle room for error that helps define it. We then next category, categorize the sensitivity of the data that resides in our design systems or designated boundaries. And there's our good old friends, CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which are the standards for everything except a SOC 2 TSP kind of audit, which has five. But this thankfully lives in this world. We're all real familiar and comfortable with these. We go through and we rank each of our data sets low, medium, or high for each of these three. And there are wonderful aids out there available for this. It's, it's not, you're not operating in a world of mystery. This is a great standard. Very prescriptive, very orderly. It's working well for us. Additionally, mapping and categorizing is helped by this NIST special publication. Now, they're not, all, not all NIST special publications are fabulous. We ran into a situation where, as part of the ongoing FedRAMP FISMA thing we're going through, we needed to set up a certificate authority to encrypt data in motion and data at rest. And we needed to know we're going to use a self-generated key so it can't be hacked, socially engineered, or anything else bad happens to it. So what kind of key do we put at the root of our certificate authority? There are seven NIST publications covering this. They're in conflict. They're in overlap. We wound up kind of taking a guess at it. I, I checked with my Fed friends out in Maryland and Washington, D.C., and we threw a dart. So it, it's not all good. But I only list credible, good, useful publications that I have experience with. And this is a really good one. Yes, sir? Can you ask questions while you're going? Please do. Okay. Um, the end part. Yes. Okay. Well, listen to that. And then the Lord said, no. uh, do you, for maintaining the inventory, um, do you have a cut system you use? You know, something you bought off the shelf, or do you have a custom system? For for this macro, above level inventory, this is verbose. 
Mm -hmm. This is two or three paragraphs mm -hmm. that will go into the SSP. The interfaces, I uh, used an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. There are, there are products out there. They are heinously expensive. Yeah. But since we're relatively small, and the, the, the macro description I'm talking of, it, it's like um, if you're reading a SOC 2, the uh, services description, it reads a little bit more like that. And then the detailed inventory of, um, you know, once you get down to server name, license key, and all that stuff. We're getting by on an Excel spreadsheet for now. We'll see how it goes. Okay. But the, our, our interfaces are that we can track in and out of there are still under 200. That's manageable. We're okay. smallish. Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to, to deal with management. Land. We've got like a million plus devices and things like that. So. <laughs> You're going to spend some money. Uh, yeah. And, and there are lists for what uh, products and services are, are certified for use in this. That's another NIST publication, by the way. Okay. <laughs> uh, you can email me and I can find it for you because I, I have the library of them. Happy to. Thanks. I wanted to point out, as Rich said, he'd like this to be interactive. So if you have questions, yes. go ahead and feel free. Just reach up and push your little button. Yeah, well, apparently for us to get our CPE hours, we have to cover 45 minutes. And I only have 721 slides in this deck. So. <laughs> You guys are going to have to come up with some stuff to keep it moving, right? Um, and once you've categorized whatever the highest classification is among your three properties is what that set is categorized as. And I gave an example here, should be pretty confidential, should, should be available or have, you know, you can't corrupt it, but by golly, we need it most of the time. And moderate runs up to you need it 99% of the time. High is 99 and above. And I'm going to touch on that. Um, but you define it as the highest, the highest standard anywhere within data classification. And the book we read and that we work with has half a chapter dedicated to this concept. Do not overclassify your data for any number of reasons. Um, availability. Up to moderate is 99%, really 99.9 .9 something. High is anything above that. All of a sudden, that becomes logarithmically more expensive. Those last hundreds and thousands are a bear. They are very, very expensive. And believe it or not, although this is federal government stuff, they preach cost savings and business alignment. They don't do it in practice, but by golly, that's, how this, that's what it preaches. It, it's business alignment all the way through. You can fail an audit if you are not business aligned. So don't overclassify. The other thing that happens is FISMA auditors rarely see highs. And when they see a high, it's game on. They're going to bring it. Yep. Don't do it unless you have to. We, we, uh, um, out, out of all the ATOs, all of our customer support, there is not a high control in there anywhere, and we have some amazingly sensitive data. Uh, we have some customers hosting Centers for Disease Control stuff. There is actually an Obama, one of the states has their uh, Affordable Care Act site on premises. There's nothing that's high in there. Even that is moderate. So a high is a rare thing, and you're not covering yourself by putting that in. You're exposing yourself. We next go in and select the appropriate controls to go with these data sets. And here's a fabulous guideline, FIPS 200. And the controls are coming out of NIST 853 Rev 4. Does everybody have some familiarity with that document? I have it in a spreadsheet format. It's a 536-page PDF document with tables of varying sizes and scope in there, and I tried every free and pay product for exporting these tables um, to an Excel spreadsheet, so I had a handy dandy checklist. It didn't exist, so in the great blizzard of 2014, snowed into my house, having nothing better to do, I hand keyed those babies. <laughs> so as a fee based service, I can share this spreadsheet with you. But it's a great thing to have. I I'm actually happy to, to pass it along to somebody that can make use of it. But by hand typing every control, there's still kind of, some of it stuck. A lot of concussions, Coach, but some of it stayed. But this document is really the key of what FISMA and FedRAMP revolve around.
And these are very prescriptive, well-designed, well-laid-out controls. Where they become nebulous is how different auditors interpret them. The next step is to actually do it. Now, in doing my own organization's work, we went a little out of order on this. We are getting a FedRAMP GSS done on the data center. So anybody that wants to build FedRAMP cloud services on top of that can inherit all our, all our FedRAMP and FISMA goodness. We're also getting a FISMA report done along with this. It's just GSS, so it's relatively limited scope. Now, as our customers see it, say the, uh, the Obamacare guys get audited by two different firms every year. Last year it was HP and Deloitte, this year it's PwC and somebody else. What they see for our FISMA compliance is just what faces the customer. Is the physical security up to snuff? Is the availability good? Is there generator fuel? Can they detect water in the case of a spill? Um, by us doing this to ourselves, all of a sudden my entire IT infrastructure, internet connectivity, and every aspect of my operation suddenly fell within scope. And I knew I had huge gaps. Um, our two-factor authentication wasn't up to snuff. Our intrusion detection wasn't up to snuff. Um, we have spent $300,000 on the first pass gap analysis. This is not the implementation. This is before we take the next pass of gap analysis to start really fine-tuning our controls. So we went out of order. People often do. And these are the people I'm talking about that do a preliminary gap analysis. And man, we better go someplace like Lifetime to get our Lifeline to get our availability and security up to snuff. But this this is where you dig down, spend the money, do the dirty work, look at those firewall configs, tune the IDS, two-factor authentication, remote phone wiping, all that goodness goes goes in at this point. This is not the most time-consuming portion, unfortunately. And along with implementing them, this is when you create the system security package, or the SSP, which is the most time-consuming report of this. This is an overviewish synopsis of what's contained in that SSP. And this is where your super detailed inventory of license keys goes, um, configuration management, which is the uh, superset of change management. Uh, and I, we've struggled organizationally with uh, change management because we started out as a two-man mom-and-pop show and now we're hundreds of thousands of square feet, hundreds of customers and uh, the deployment plans they give you to do this and there is a NIST publication that covers this. Um, addressing as a, configura a baseline configuration which you then manage changes to philosophically helped us along. I don't know if change control is the bane of everyone else's existence, but I have seen organizations struggle with it, and I have seen it executed poorly to where it causes damage and harm to organizations and costs them a great deal of money. All kinds of fun there. This is a very thick report. The GSS we're producing to turn in, is, we're estimating it's going to be in between 450 and 550 pages. And then we're going to pay somebody to read it and dissect it gets very expensive. And this is who makes it expensive. You have to bring in an external auditor to come in, read it, vet it, test your controls, and there could be hundreds of controls by this time, but it's what we all do best. Good old-fashioned audit work. And we have seen this done, um, one of the required audits of that ACA site, it was HP sent somebody that had never done it before. We, we had to walk them through the process. Deloitte sent somebody that was familiar with the terminology. They did some evidence and artifacts gathering, and then we started getting emails three weeks later. Well, we still need this, 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 and this, and this. So expertise is growing out here, but it, it's still lacking in a lot of quarters. And then you get the thing authorized. So you have your SSP, which may or may not have some remediation work in it. And the Office of the Inspector General and the Government Accounting Office will bless it. Question. Um, is there a lifetime to that authorization? There is. Um, I'll catch that on step six. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Is it a requirement to have that uh, audited? Yes. To have a FISMA authority to operate? Absolutely. 
the government by law can't do business on a system that hasn't got undergone this process. And this is subcontractors, student loan servicers, stuff like that is where we're seeing it. Um, if you struggled and it wasn't up to snuff and you have a lot of remediation that's going to have to be done, you produce a POM, Plan of Action and Milestones. This interim or provisional, and keep in mind, we're going to see another provisional ATO here. This, this is one kind. This is the FISMA flavor. There is also a FedRAMP flavor. Th that is only good for six months. So if you had a lot of remediation, you have to get through it all in six months. The Office of, if your agency services, anything involving the of Office of Management and Budget, no go. Fix your stuff, resubmit. Every submission is another six to eight weeks through the Joint Accreditation Board. Um, and they're all issuing fewer and fewer of these because if they give you an authority to operate and you have some serious security stuff to remediate, they're putting taxpayer, federal taxpayer information out there in an unsafe environment. It's bad enough in a safe environment. And then to your point, um, in the FISMA side, if you have a very verifiable and approved continuous monitoring program that has been vetted by the GAO and the approving authorities, it just maintains itself year in and year out. If you do not have one, you must reassess your controls and test 30 to 40 percent of them annually. And nobody is getting a very good handle on this. We haven't seen many approved. The people I work with haven't. It's a great concept. Um, but this is what it winds up being. That's not entirely a bad thing, to my thinking. You can't sit on your hands and do nothing. So how can we learn more about FISMA so it's not an enigma? 15 minutes with me is not going to do the trick, not even close. You can become a certified FISMA compliance practitioner, and these are the guys that do that. It's a three-day course. Uh, offered lots of places. I went to Columbia, Maryland for some specific reasons. Um, it's really dry. <laughs> that, that was a really long three days. You, you just can't dress this stuff up. I'm trying, but it is what it is. But these are great people to work with. And uh, you will, when you do that, you will, you will use the FISMA Compliance Handbook. Hard to see on there. That was written by a lady named Laura P. Taylor. She has sat on FISMA committee. She sat on the FedRAMP committee for two years. She wrote the book that came before this. She wrote the book. I went to the class she taught, and she was my test proctor. The test wasn't easy or fun. I scored in the 80s, which hurt my feelings. I like to do better than that. Um, it's just acronym and this publication number soup that you have to commit to memory, and that doesn't go with my history of concussions or my wild and crazy youth. It just doesn't work for me. But I, I got through it. They have an interest in you passing the test. But it was extremely worthwhile. And where this serves us very well is when we have people come in to do federal auditing, one of the first things we ask them are, are you a CFCP? No, you're not. Well, are you a CISA? C anything? CISSP? Come on, help us out here. Um, try to get that upper hand on your auditors when they come in, right? Everybody does that to us. So you can establish some turf that way. But this, this, the course was really valuable. It, uh, it goes through what I did there, but over the course of three days, you can come out of there with a very good roadmap, and they give you a thumb drive with several gig of resources, templates, wonderful, beautiful templates. Just search and replace, fill those babies in. Worked great. So I, I highly recommend these guys. Very good to work with. We still work actively with uh, Laura Taylor. I'm out there uh, in D.C. with her week after next, helping her with a uh, work with a federal client doing a federal project whose availability is not congruent with their confidentiality and integrity. They're going to fail audits, but more importantly, they're going to waste $150 million in taxpayer money, which is a drop in the bucket given all the commas and zeros flying around. But How much for the training, Rich? It was, I think it was 1500 plus travel.
Now we move on to FedRAMP, and this is newer and more exciting to a lot of folks. It has a lot of words in it, but this is cloud. Yes, Stacy. Yes. This this is it does not have to be a, a certified three PAO. The auditor does not have to meet standards, their report does. As long as they can meet those guidelines, it's legitimate. FedRAMP is not like that. But FedRAMP is, uh, by golly, everybody wants to go to the cloud and they want to go there now. FedRAMP is how you certify cloud infrastructure for use by government agencies. And I get most of my CPE, hour, CPE hours by going to ISACA and Deloitte functions. And three years ago, four years ago, when this program was coming into being, all my auditor friends were going to become 3PAOs. And all my data center and cloud friends were going to become FedRAMP certified. Many of them didn't. And in talking to the auditors we're working with to do our FedRAMP certification, 80% of them have bailed on the project when they get as far as we have, which is only one third into it. It is a bear. So here is how you do your FISMA certification and accreditation. Those are the steps. FedRAMP looks different. Instead of doing an inventory, you are really worried about s the system boundaries, what can be gotten to by the internet facing side of the cloud. You don't have to categorize because everything at FedRAMP is moderate. No lows, no highs, all moderates. They've already set that for you. There will be no highs because you can't set it high and face it to the internet. Not happening. They're talking about it, but it's going to be a while off. And given some of the recent breaches we've seen, I don't think it's coming. So you take your moderate baseline security controls and you put together your SSP and you have it assessed, and we're going to walk through some of these in a little more detail, and then you get it authorized. And for monitoring, you cannot put in a continuous monitoring program. You're going to eat it every year. Now, all controls are monitoring, so you set them up. Implement them, get it authorized. And it's our old friend, 853 Rev4, and CIA. You have it assessed. A 3PAO is a third party assessor organization. And I had 500 friends that were going to become 3PAOs. It's like what, there were 56 SEALs that served in Vietnam and I know all 5,000 of them. It was, it was that kind of a deal. Um, it's a lot tougher than it looked to everybody. There are 38 of them listed on FedRAMP.gov, formerly cloud.cio.gov, 38 of them in total. And there's a funny number that's going to come up here that speaks to that. They s prepare your SSP and they submit it to the Joint Accreditation Board. If it doesn't pass, there is no remediation plans. You take it back and you resubmit it again six to eight weeks is the turnaround time on these. People are taking two or three shots at it and still failing. And this 3PAO is charging you every time it happens. Um, the first pass we got to do our little modest GSS. Keep in mind, our IT exists on an HP DL380 virtualized. One, that thick. And some firewalls and video. I've spent 300,000 already. The uh, 3PAO. The, uh, the big players, uh, Coal Fire, and the ones that the big agencies are using, wanted a buck fifty to do the initial pass at it. There are some smaller players out there trying to get traction. They've achieved the, sort of the 3PAO status and haven't used it, so they're, you can do a little shopping around. The risk you take is that they won't prepare the proper SSP, and the Joint Accreditation Board will kick it back. And you start getting into these six to eight week delays missed commitments to prospective customers. Um, how we're going to work around that is we're going to work with Laura P. Taylor as a consultant and some other people we have on hand to wordsmith that very carefully 
We get the feeling the three PAO we're working with hasn't done a lot of them. We're going to work with people that have been doing FISMA since 2002, get them perfectly wordsmithed, and hopefully sneak it through on the first or second try. That is our hope. And then you're monitoring the hard way. They're going to have to come back and revisit 30 to 40 percent of your controls. But if you paid a buck fifty for the assessment, you're going to pay half of that. You're paying 50 percent of what you originally paid to get a third of your controls assessed. Sounds fair. That's how it works, sadly. Um, where are we with the adoption of this? Everybody was going to do it. Very few have. Um, there were some regional sort of localish uh, cloud services providers saying they were offering FedRAMP services. You can go to cloud.cio.gov and see who's listed. They, in fact, were not. It's very easy to do. But there are 17 provisionals out there. And provisional here doesn't mean you didn't pass muster. It means you've done everything perfectly right, but no government agency has come along and sought an authority to operate in your environment. It means you're good, you just haven't sold anything yet. So that 450000 you spent, it's kind of parked there for a while. But there are 17 of those out there. That's crazy. There are 16 agencies, and this, this can be um, Amazon Web Services and some of these others that some agencies have moved to, GovCloud, they call it. That was uh, certified under a previous set of FedRAMP standards, not NIST 800. 53 Rev 4, and they are looking at a short period of time to recertify under that or get yanked. And there are three cloud service supplied packages out there. Uh, QTS is one of them. They're kind of competitor to us. We are also building some cloud infrastructure of our own. We see that being FedRAMP certified in about 18 months. It's going to take us that long. But we will be the only data center company out there with a GSS available on here. But if you total those up, there are less of those than there are certified 3PAOs available to do it. That means you have some total rookies sitting out there who haven't done it. At least two, right? There's, the numbers don't add up. That caught me out. I, I was just putting these numbers together this afternoon because this penetration is, is kind of a moving target. But it will be interesting to see if some of these numbers go backwards, because those are going to be the big players, the Googles, the Amazon Gov Clouds, and some of those. If you go to FedRAMP.gov, about six weeks ago, they put a link on there, um, which I didn't have time to type in, and I apologize. There is some self-training on this stuff out there, and it's free. Well, you, the taxpayer, already paid for it. But you can learn a lot about this. I came into FedRAMP after having been involved with FISMA for three or four years. I don't know what it would look like to start there, but there is a lot of education. They are trying to remove the enigma. The government really wants to push everything off to the cloud. We will have to see if it happens. That was a quick 700-some-odd slides, wasn't it? Um, yes, sir. Yes, um, in order to do the assessment according to the Fed ramp, uh, we need to get certified. It's not like FISMA certification. It's not like FISMA assessment, correct? To conduct the certifications? Uh, no, like uh, to do the assessment as per the Fed ramp compliance. Oh, a three PAO? Yes. yes, that is a certification you obtain from the federal government, okay. and it makes a PCI DSS QSA certification look trivial. Okay. It's very, it's tough. That's why there are so few. You, you look at how big the country is and how much money is floating around, and there's only 38 of them. Is it a mandatory to go through the certification or you not know, do the FedRAMP assessment, or is it? Yes, yeah, if, if 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 a government agency is going to put data or systems on your cloud, absolutely by law, it has to be FedRAMP certified, and that has to have been set, assessed by a federally authorized third-party assessment organization. But I, I, uh, the guys doing it for us um, are also a, a QSA. And uh, he had just a, obtained this. And he was, uh, as business owner to business owner, he was singing the blues. I guess it was excruciating. 
And what's discouraging to them is they are having, he said, fully 80% of their people trying to attain this certification bail a third of the way into it because they are not organizationally capable of getting there. I mean, the, the computing disciplines and, and rigorous requirements, are they're tough. They're becoming our normal. We're getting used to it. You know, two-factor authentication, smart cards, that kind of stuff. But it's, uh, this represents change, big change. It makes people feel restricted. I mean, most of us are pretty paranoid with our information. Uh, to, to information lay people, or especially, you know, the data center workers we have. We have electricians, diesel mechanics, and HVAC guys. Uh, this all feels very restrictive and chafing to them. So I, I can only imagine it in, in really large organizations how that goes. But they bail. Any questions? FISMA, FedRAMP, uh, data center fund, reliability centered maintenance? At the end of the day, on a scale of one to ten, one being not much, ten being awesome. How much do you think it actually improves the security of the operations? I'd give it a seven. It proves due diligence, but the the standard is evolving slowly, and as the hackers are way out in front of us, uh, we 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 have witnessed a FISMA moderate system be breached within the last week and we know they were fully in compliance completely within the letter of the law of course target had passed their pci audit so one of the, this is a lot more rigorous so we uh we are hoping we get to see the forensic data that comes out of this yes sir yeah no no that this one is uh that this one is nda and under wraps but it's a little scary that it happened. No, it, it's it's somebody who outsources their data center, but they uh, hold several federal ATOs or authority to operate on this system. They are also um, everybody familiar with Common Security Framework (CSF) from High Trust. They are, uh, they, they'd made that a three year project and they were two and a half years into it. So they have that level of control. For those not familiar, um, everybody knows that HIPAA is a pretty nebulous thing with suggestions, recommendations, it's not prescriptive and detailed. There's an offshoot of HIPAA called High Trust and an offshoot of that called the Common Security Framework. And that has pulled from NIST 800-53 R4, um, IRS-1075, ISO 27000, all kinds of good places. And it actually does pull some NIST 853 high controls into it, but it is extremely prescriptive. And we're really hoping that kind of replaces HIPAA as, as the way for hospital and IT systems and medical information systems to be accredited and put into operation. So, something needs to happen there. These are the opinions of the speaker. So, Rich, I've got another question for you. Yes, sir. Most of this is uh, built around preventing data breaches. Yes. Um, do you see a shift or a change coming down the pike um, with a shift in, in security? We're beginning to operate from the assumption that we've already been breached and data exfiltration is really what we should be focusing on. Do you see anything changing in the federal sector about that coming not, down the pike? Not yet. It will be interesting to watch how this breach that we're observing progresses because they're subject to the same laws as businesses. If there has been exfiltration for sure, then they're going to have to report it to everybody there. And what is it? The average time, last I heard from Deloitte, the average time to detect a breach is 200 days. That, that may not be current. If anybody has something more current, I'd like to hear it. But it's been exfiltrated by then. It's over. Well, again, going back to the, the IRS uh, example, we all know that the systems can be compromised. Absolutely. Regardless of whether FedRAMP or FISMA is in place. And what worries me is that the, the federal standards are not looking at data exfiltration at the moment. They're kind of staying behind the curve on all that. And that's really where we need to be focusing, I think, in the future. I think they're kind of behind the curve on everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, they, they don't, uh, we, we have this thing we called moving it 
we call moving at the speed of lifeline. Two owners, we make decisions quickly, we bud, you know. So our urgent is not like anybody else's urgent, and we're now involved with a federal agency that's gonna come onto our infrastructure as a services cloud, and they told us this is really urgent. This is just pants on fire, we have to move quickly. I'm like, oh man, we're gonna have like 60 or 90 days. Oh no, fast for them is 2Q16. By then, you know, we'll be onto the next generation of servers and firewalls and 38 revisions of checkpoint firewall code. Um, and and that's, the, that's the speed at, with, at which they're rewriting these standards and rethinking them. And I, I don't have an answer on how they fix it. But this, this isn't working. Yes, sir. If I have a vendor that is or vendor certified, um, I mean, obviously that was a very high standard. Yes. I pretty much take that and and do very little, or do I still have to do quite a bit? Nope. If if they are if it's a FISMA situation, you ask them for what's called an SAR security assessment report, and that is not law, but it is close. That can be reevaluated. A FedRAMP certification is the law. It's done. There is nothing more to do. That's why I've expected to see it do better. And I, I can only guess that the degree of difficulty is what's holding it back. But that's a beautiful thing. That is, that is correct, and some of them are preparing to lose it. When, when I heard of this program three or four years ago, I thought it was going to be huge. And we didn't bother jumping in because we didn't think we were going to get to the party in time. Um, looks like we're going to be an early arrival. Didn't mean to. Um, but for instance, the reason I'm doing a FedRAMP GSS on the data center is that's law. That doesn't get re-audited. You hand that to the federal agency and it's over with. And in a CF CSF setting, you can hand that to that auditor and it's done. They just stick it in the folder check the box and move on. There's no secondary work to be done on it. Where an SAR can be revisited, you may have to walk around and point at security measures and water detection and things like that. So has it been worth it? We don't know. <laughs> as far as Lifeline's journey on that, we don't know. And Alex and I, it's just our money. It's two guys. We are not a build it and they were com will come kind of organization. Um, we don't do anything typically that is not cash flow positive within 90 days. And you know, the capital expenditures in a data center are, are terrifying. I, uh, Dana can personally attest. It's, these are scary numbers we throw around out there, but we always have to be cash flow positive within 90 days. We are spending all this money in a build it and they will come posture. Way outside of my comfort zone, but we feel pretty strongly it's gonna pay off. Will this apply to the Fort Wayne uh, facility that you're looking at building? Yes, absolutely. It will achieve an even higher, even higher level of certification. Um, if I can take two or three minutes, just, just something that's going on with there, there's a thing winding its way through Congress. It's headed to the Reconciliation Committee we haven't had a chance to read it, called the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act. It addresses solar flares and EMP. And we are wondering why this became so urgent. EMP has always been out there as a threat. Electromagnetic pulse destroys everything electronic in its path. Or a, a solar cast off that hits something critical. The city of Ottawa was without power, full power for a couple of months. They had some transformers taken out that had to be built from scratch because they were so big. We don't keep those in reserve. It's something they need to do and will do. Um, but if you read uh, and have been listening to the news, it's leaked out that Boeing has developed a weapon that has been in service since 2012, which does directional EMP. It looks like a Predator drone, but it faces down. Word just leaked out that that's been going on. Now, 
So three years after this weapon goes into production, the U.S. finally takes serious measures to address its implications. Um, and we think electromagnetic pulse protection is going to find its way back into FISMA and FedRAMP at the moderate and high levels. So we are building the Fort Wayne facility to be EMP resistant on day one. And there, there's a lot of enigma wrapped around that. And we're, we're already getting inquiries from people who know they're going to fall under the CIPA or Critical Infrastructure Protection Act. And we're also going to do some of the more formalized stuff. Lifeline Data Centers doesn't carry a rated four or tier four rating because of the, uh, there are things in those standards, Uptime Institute and the other data center standards, which are uh, arbitrary and su superfluous to data center uptime and security. We're probably going to incorporate enough of those in there to, pro we're looking at a Bixie level one certification. I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, but that facility, we are rolling we are learning from every mistake we've made in the last 14 and a half years and not repeating it there. We'll make new ones. Anything else? I thank you for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. Everybody's time is precious and valuable. So I, I hope I've respected it. Thank you very much.